I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This week I'm talking to Aaron Bertelson about his new book, Grow Fruit and Vegetables in Pots. Aaron is the resident kitchen gardener at Great Dixter, but as with many who work there, he lives and breathes the Great Dixter way of life and works tirelessly to support the house and garden. You may find him harvesting produce in the kitchen garden, serving lunch to guests and students, hosting horticultural royalty in the house, or travelling the world to promote Great Dixter. One of my first encounters with Aaron happened when I got lost trying to find a way into the house and the kitchen courtyard gate was open a crack. Hoping this was a suitable entry point, I tentatively pushed the gate open and stuck my head around to be confronted by Aaron coming out of the kitchen door bellowing, that gate is there for a reason, to keep people like you out. I'm still not sure whether he was joking or not, but it makes me giggle. We recorded this at the kitchen table in the Great Dixter house, Aaron wearing a cotton nightshirt that made him look like a cross between a dashing highway man and wee willy winky, and Connor for the Dachshund nestled on a cushion by his side. My first question is... You talk in the book about combining crops. What are some of your favourite combinations? Well, I think it changes through the year what what works and what doesn't. But I think one of the one of the crops that I particularly like is curly leaf parsley and violas. I adore violas. I think they go with everything. They, t- for me, in the pot garden, they bring it all together. Having that common theme running through the pots brings it all together. So violas go with everything. I think of another very good crop is. The apricot, with underneath the apricot, the alpine strawberries. I think it's a really nice combination. Last year we had apples, uh, we had the apple tree, and underneath it we had um, nasturtiums. I thought that looked really good. It changes all the time, but there's lots of... I think it's nice to play foliage off each other, so different foliage effects working together is is, makes a good crop. But um, as a whole, I think there's a lot of green, so bringing in some colour every now and then helps tie it together and having the same thing like a veil running through so it's not just about the kind of usable crops it is partly about the look of it well no every i mean violas are edible nasturtiums are edible so the flowers that you're going to use obviously need to be edible because that's the whole point of the the area but not every single pot in the uh in the kitchen courtyard is edible but that's the, the the aim is to have mostly edible so As long as it's edible, you know, edible flowers can play a big part and they'll tie it all together, so... Mm. Sorry, I didn't phrase that very well. I meant it's... You're not sort of slavishly tied to the production side of it. You can play with the aesthetics as well. Well, you have to play with the aesthetics because it's outside the kitchen. And so... The whole the whole reason it started was because it was a, an, air, an underutilised area. It was a nothing area. And so that's how the pot garden grew, was having to have something attractive in that area. So aesthetics is really crucial um, to make it look good and break up all that, you know, it's brick, uh, brick walls, brick floor, tiled roofs. It's all lots and lots of t- uh, red terracotta. So... Uh, Having some foliage in there helps. And yet you've gone for red terracotta pots. Yeah, because I think they work really well. But some of the pots are stone, some are tin. Um, but I think at, at Great Dixter, traditionally, terracotta was used. So, uh, that you know, it's easy, it, it works well. But then the foliage takes over. Hopefully, you don't notice the pots. They're just something to grow the foliage in. So, yeah, I have kept with that theme but I've put lots of plants in the pots to fill up that that terracotta and do you go vertically as well absolutely and that's why fruit trees I think are really good and uh, trained against the wall things like I've got uh, an apricot in an old um, reservoir tin um, that's uh, espalier I've got fan trained peach uh, so that sort of thing uses the vertical because that's really crucial is because in a small space a lot of your space can be vertical so if you don't use that it's a huge waste mm. and it, it just looks rather dull and heavy if it's all on the ground and then there's these big walls around so vertical is important I haven't I haven't quite gone down the uh, 
hanging basket. I'm not sure that it would work quite <laughs> at Great Dicks. It looks good outside a pub, but I'm sure <laughs> I don't know if we could do it here. <laughs> and so different size pots as well. Oh, yeah. To go and break it up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And how is the terracotta when it comes to watering? Terracotta, absolutely fine. It's, I'm, I know there's that big thing about it losing moisture, but, you know, we are in England. It's not, we're not in the southern states of America or uh, Australia, so I think terracotta works very well. Uh, it's, it's not a massive problem. Hmm. So one of the things I was really interested in finding out is, is it possible to have things to harvest all year round? Absolutely. I think the, the crucial thing is to know the span from seed to table because if you know that you know how to have crops ready throughout the year you know how long something's going to be in a space also making use of space having different crops in one pot you can have things all the time so at the moment out there we've got kale we've got uh parsley we've got sorrel we've got rhubarb just starting in the forsa um chard so there's there is i mean this time of the year in the open ground we've got less stock we're less to eat but we have got something we the same with the pots it's just having having that sort of foresight to know when things are going to be at their best and do you plan that of course. Of course. Darling, it doesn't happen it. on its own. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you plan it? By knowing when things are going to be at their best, knowing something like a chard, I know I'm going to get a year out of it. I know that it's going to be fine in a pot till about April. So at that point, that is going to be a big part of the cropping gone. So what what can I have in the in the pots that will take over? Curly leaf parsley. I always thought it was a garnish. It's not a garnish. It's a fantastic winter crop. When it gets cold, the sugar levels rise as they do kale. And so that's an, a crop that will push through. Sorrel comes in uh, in late winter. So that's a crop that can take over from chard. So it's just, and getting things started early. You know, when you're growing in pots in a courtyard, you've got a microclimate. And it's easy to go out at night and put a bit of uh, cover over them, some protection if it's going to be a cold night. And we are in a sort of semi, not, uh, I can't think of the word, um, the climate we're in. It's, I mean, it's not a hard climate, really, down in the southeast of England. It's a sort of more temperate, that's the word. You should have helped me with that word. I was watching you struggle. I know, you loved it. I could see it on your face. Um, we're in a more temperate climate, and even more so because we're in the kitchen courtyard. And do you document that, or is that all in your head? It's all in my head, unfortunately. Is it? And I went to a really interesting talk when I was in the States about the lady, the curator at Monticelli, Cello, Monticello, um, Thomas Jefferson's garden. And in his notes, he used to write when it was sown, uh, when it came through, and when it came to table. And I think it's a really useful thing to write those notes down. But it all comes with practice, and every year is going to be different anyway. Because, you know, sometimes spring starts early, sometimes it's late, you have cold, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a changeable feast in a way. It's not the same year on year. Is there anything that doesn't work in a pot? I, I was probably most disappointed with artichokes. I thought they would have done better, but they need to have a really rich soil and a big, big pot. And I think I've, I've done well with them when they're young and they've, they've budded up well, but... Over time, I think they need to be changed every year and they need a bigger pot, as big a pot as possible because they're really hungry feeders. Even in the open ground, you've got to give them organic matter every year and we split them every two years in the open ground. So they are a hungry feeder, so you've got to replicate that in the ground. Mm. So that would be... Uh, I mean, it's like I said earlier. With uh, um, it's a climate. It's ch the climate it plays a big part. If we have a good summer, some crops romp away, whereas others struggle. You know, the big leaf things don't like it as much when it's really hot. Uh, they need to be a bit more shady, whereas tomatoes and Mediterranean plants are going to love it. So, uh, depending on the, the, what what summer and winter and spring and autumn we have, depends on how well the crops are going to do. And how about feeding them? Obviously, you well, you do, do need to feed them. Um, we use a liquid feed, liquid seaweed. Uh, we also, a lot of the plants that are going to stay in the pots 
things like the fruit trees, I top dress them and I'm using a lot of leaf mold now on them. I'm a great fan of leaf mold, a one year old leaf mold as a layer on the top and that breaks down and brings worms in and feeds the soil. So I think leaf mold and it also gives them protection in the winter. So I do that in the autumn, I clean them up and mulch them with leaves um, and uh, so all the pots that are permanent get that treatment. You don't find that encourages anything like slugs and snails? No, no. no. Awesome. Yeah. So when I, when I was reading the book, one of the things I thought about was, I think you mentioned tarragon, and you can kind of decimate a plant yeah. if you're having a big meal. Um, what do you do with, with a pot what, if you do happen to harvest it really severely and it looks really unsightly? What can you do with it? Well, there's things like tarragon is going to be, well, which I've got looking really fantastic at the moment, so that's one of the earlier crops. Um what you need to do is cut it back, top dress it, give it some fresh soil and then water it well and let it get going because it usually will. Things like mint by midsummer, unless you're making mojitos every night, they're gonna, it's going to get, you know, as mint does. And it's in that pot where it gets suffocated, you know, it grows so vigorous in that. And so I think feeding it regularly and also harvesting, the more you harvest, the better it's going to be. Is there anything that you find you consistently run out of or that you can't grow quickly enough? Well, unfortunately, the scale I'm cooking is not relative to a lot of people's scale because, you know, I'll have a study day for 40 people, so I could wipe out a whole crop in one day. So it's not really... I, I'm not a very good judge of that. I think someone who grows in a realistic environment would be able to answer that better, but... I can wipe out crops quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing generally goes to waste or runs to seed. What is your favourite salad leaf crop? It's a good one. Uh, maybe sorrel. I love sorrel. I love that lemony flavour. I think it makes very good soup, very good sauce. And it's a crop that comes when you're kind of on your knees looking for food, really. It's coming in now. It's coming into its own. And... You know, you've probably run out of kale, you've run out of a lot of things. So it's kind of like, thank goodness that's just coming through. And there is a sort of, there's a feeling that it's giving you a lot of goodness when you eat sorrel. That it's such a rich taste, that flavour is so unique. And you can't get it in the shops because it doesn't, it doesn't travel well. Once it's been picked, you've got to use it pretty much straight away because it wilts. Mm, and that's just cut and come again, is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The mo and the more you cut that, the less it'll run to seed because it's a dock you know it's its purpose is to run to seed quite quickly before uh summer so that's what i'll do but the more you use it the better it is and how do you get around um flea beetle on things like rocket i thought you had a good tip for that uh I've, well my advice is don't plant any mustards uh crops before the 4th of july because that way you're you're just missing their life cycle so after the 4th of July, that's when I do my sowing. And the first few leaves can sometimes be hit and miss, but you just get on and eat them. And anyway, in the middle of summer, there's so many other crops. Um, but that's after the 4th of July is my moment to, um, to start sowing mustardy and rockets and all that sort of thing. And where do you start them off? Um, in Mrs. Next Door's glass house, generally. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so everyone needs a Mrs. Next Door. Everyone needs a Mrs. Next Door. Yeah. But also, you know, a window sills fine, and if, or or directly sow and think. There's a lot of crops that you can directly sow that'll do well. But because I'm a control freak with spacing of pots and or you know, of plants and pots, and also on the open ground, I like to start them off in plugs, and then I can place them perfectly so they look beautiful. Very good. Um, I was interested about you growing the sea kale and I wondered, um, does that need salt in the soil or the water? No, it doesn't. No, weirdly. I can't believe that grows in a pot. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it grows in open ground as well. Yeah. Um, and, it, it, you know, Tom grows it at grave type. But it's like, the, the, the most critical thing for that is you've got to force it, take its crop off, and it usually uh, is cropping about the 21st of April, my birthday, um, which is a great thing to have for your birthday lunch. Um, and then you've got to let it grow normally so it can put stock back into its roots. Because if, you know, it's like rhubarb, you can't just force it and force it because you are weakening, weakening the plant. Mm. So which bit of that do you use? Of the sea cow, sea cow. The stems, the new stems. So I've got the forces on that at the moment, right. I think. 
Can't remember. Better go and check. Yeah, I better have a look. <laughs> it's still slightly early anyway, so... But I think... Yeah, I think I've got them on. I certainly have of the um, rhubarb. And the um, chicory. The chicory's done very well this year. Yeah, that always seems like a bit of a faff to me. It's not at all. Isn't it? It's, it? What you need to do is you need to grow the root over summer and then the, in the autumn you lift them and bung them as close to, together as possible in a pot and then put a forcer over the top and put it in a dark area. I've got it down in our storeroom out the, off the kitchen yard and it's full of... Uh, we've got a symposium in two weeks and I'm going to use it for that. And it doesn't get nobbled by... Slugs it can do. Or, You've got to keep yeah. an eye on that sort of thing. Look, you can't just leave crops. You've got to, you know, go make sure they're not being. And we use an organically approved um, organic um, slug pallet on those sort mm. of things. Right. What I think works quite well is just putting it around the edge, so they're going to eat that. And the other thing to do, if you want, you can also just put it around the ground, so they're not going to crawl up into the pot, so it's not near the crop. Mm. But they will find it. They're hungry as well. It's not mm. just you that's hungry in winter. No. Um, I noticed in some of your recipes you cook lettuce in them. You, yeah. you use cooked lettuce leaves, Soup. which seems quite unconventional. Well, I think, I think the French would... I think Louis the Fourteenth was eating lettuce soup. Oh, um, and if it was good enough for Louis... <laughs> no, I think it's, um, it's a great way to use these crops like lettuce where there's a... And as summer progresses, the, the leaves become bitter... And so using them in soups, it's not gonna, you're going to lose that bitterness mm. because they're with other things. With the, with the, when you're using them straight, you're going to have more sort of bitterness. So um, I think the more interesting ways you can use things like lettuce than just salad is good and soup is very nice. Mm. Well, it sounds like nothing goes to waste. No. If it the is. slugs don't eat it, I do. <laughs> um, and I wondered about the... We did sort of briefly talk about apricots and things... What are the best fruits to grow in pots? Everything. The, the most important thing is that they've got to be grown on a dwarf fruit stock. And that's critical. And now that the population is living more in an in, in urban environment, there's a lot of breeding going on with fruit for pots. In a, so dwarf... St- I mean, a, most garden centres actually... It's easier to find dwarf now in a lot of general garden centres than standard because people aren't planting orchards like they used to, but a lot of people want them for courtyards. So it's perfect. Uh, I think if you've got a sunny wall, grow something interesting like a peach or an apricot or, you know, uh, it's, it's in this country anyway, it's easy to find pears and apples and things, but there's nothing quite like having an apricot straight off the tree or a peach or it's quite exotic or a nectarine. I've got a nectarine out there in a pot, which works very well. The rats loved it last year, so they can't be wrong. <laughs> um, so there's lots that you can grow and it's all dwarf stock. So it doesn't become big and, uh, become problematic in a pot mm. and it gives structure to the pot garden to the you know to have some something of a decent size and winter looks good because otherwise everything dies back and there's just a few leaves you, you have that winter uh, interest blueberries look very win- good in the winter you know with their red foliage uh, stems so mm. there's lots that can grow i guess you're all right here but i wonder if you were in an urban situation whether you might have a problem with pollination if you're on a balcony or something. Well, get self-pollinated fruit. I mean, most. I mean, the days of having to have male and female are pretty much self-pollinating is is like is as common as dwarf nowadays. It's it's not such a big issue. Mm. Okay, strawberries. Yeah, fantastic in a pot. Both alpine and regular strawberries, and Connor for the Daxon loves. Um, uh, the, strawberries so they've just got to be high enough that she doesn't eat all of them she leaves some for me <laughs> do you need to grow them in one of those strawberry pots or will anything do i grow them i don't grow mine in a strawberry pot i find them incredibly unattractive for strawberry pots um but that's a personal thing i just grow mine in a standard terracotta pot and also i've got them under the apricot the alpine strawberries in the in the, tro- in the reservoir that was in the top of the house um and i think they do very well in that mm. Do you worry about the drainage in your pots? Do you stand them on feet or put crocs or anything like we, that? I, every pot has crocs. 
but I don't stand them up. Gen Unless I want to get some height out of them, then I'll put them on bricks and that'll have... But I put croc... You've got, I think you've got to put crocs because they will become waterlogged. So, mm -hmm. you know, when a terracotta break, a pot breaks there, you've got a croc, or when you throw a plate at a loved one, pick it up afterwards and um, use it as a croc. <laughs> Do you ever bring your pots indoors? Is that an option? Well, I think, think you can answer that yourself by looking at the windowsill and seeing pots inside. Yes, it is. They're not edible. No, but they're from the outside, the begonias, which over, over, wind, over summer outside. Yeah. If, you know, definitely. Pelagoniums, pelagoniums, all that sort of thing. If it's going to be very cold, of course I'll bring them in. And that's one of the joys of having things grown in pots is, you know, you can just lift them in at night and put them somewhere warm and then... You know, it doesn't have to be far from the door, mm. but it's just going to give them that protection. Cool. Yeah. Um, a lot of the recipes are inspired by people that you've met or they belong to people that you've met, which yeah. I think is a really lovely thing. Um, do you kind of use, do you purposely use recipes that people have gifted you in the book? No, it's not a per. Well, it's generally, I mean, when you're a gardener and, a, and you cook... People like to give you recipes, and when you're op and this is one of the, I think one of the joys of being open to the public is that you'll be working away in the garden and you'll be maybe work weeding around chard, and someone will come and say, "Well, how do you use the crop?" And then they'll tell you how they use it, and suddenly you've got a new recipe. And a lot of my friends are as greedy as myself and cook, and so you can't help but share recipes. So. I do use a lot of friends' recipes because generally it's better that a friend recommends it and you can someone that you, if you, that you trust them, then or you've had a, the recipe that you know they've cooked for you and you say I want a res that recipe, then it naturally comes. Mm. So it's something I think people who garden and cook do. They naturally swap recipes and talk about you know when you have them over for a meal, they sort of say well I do this or I do that and you try their recipes. So. Um, but also it does, it, I mean, it really proves that point, that sharing advice, sharing recipes is all part of the community that we're in. You know, we're not an island where we do it all ourselves. I mean, I'm part of a, I'm a small cog in a big world. And so, yeah, I get recipes from lots of different people. If you had to only grow Here we go. three pots... You can have different things in each, but you've only got three pots. What would you grow? A fig tree. Definitely a fig tree. I adore for it, figs. Which, uh, which one? Well, I'm growing white Marseille for the first time. So I'm not... I, black turkey is a fantastic... Brown turkey, sorry. Brown turkey is a fantastic fig. But I quite like the idea of the white Marseille. So I've just got that... The, so it should crop next year or this year. Um... Chard, I think, is a fantastic crop. Um, the peppermint, because you get that the red legs on it and the good green, and and you get a year out of your, uh, out of the pot. What else? Would I, sorrel, I'd definitely grow sorrel. How many have I? How yeah, many? that's it. Yeah, but what if I've got lots in a pot? What if the pot's um massive? You could only have one thing in each pot. Oh my God, she's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, go on then, one more. Mint. Mint. Okay. Yeah. I think mint's a great crop because I hate it in the open ground because it's such a thuggish plant. In a pot, you can control it, but it's also it, it is useful in the kitchen. Mojitos, mint uh, with fresh potatoes, mints with potato salad. Um, there's a lot of mint in salads. There's so many things you can use. It, it's a good fresh taste. Mm. So yeah. And what's the thing you battle with most? What's the most difficult thing about growing food in containers? Watering. It's, a, it's, it's part of... You've got to be dedicated to it because plants can't be just left. And in the open ground, they're more forgiving. In a pot, they're less forgiving. It's going to dry out much quicker. So watering is probably the battle. But... There's something quite... I usually do it in the evening when everyone's gone and it's just me. And it's quite calming at the end of the day just to walk around watering. And, and it, I think one of the good things about watering is it gives you a chance to really look at the... If you do it properly, it gives you a chance to look, actually look at the crops. 
so you can see what's actually if there's a problem you can usually pick it up through watering because you're actually standing there looking whereas usually you're flitting around rushing about you're not stopping and looking so watering is good for that yeah and it helps if you have a gla- you know hose in one hand a glass in the other of course yeah <laughs> <laughs> Is it anything that you think I've missed off or that you'd like to talk about? No, I don't think so. I think everyone can... The theme of the book is everyone can grow something. I think start off slowly. This is where... It's like any project. If you take too much on, it becomes a chore. If you take it slowly, I think... See, when I first started growing things in pots, I just had a, a couple of species... Tu- Gardens Illustrated were doing a promotion on um, Rembrandt tulips, so I bought them. And then I thought, well, that was pretty, having something in that courtyard, and it led to some herbs. And then it, and it then becomes like a virus. You know, you can't stop it. You Suddenly you filled up the whole space. But it's better to start that way than filling up the whole space and then thinking, oh, my God... I can't cope with this. You know, over a season, you'll see how much you can cope with and and either grow or not grow more of it. Mm. Well, I'm inspired. I don't know why I haven't done it before. I suppose it's more sometimes if I'm not at home, that's the problem. Yeah. Because if I've got pelargoniums, I was even thinking of putting cactus in my pots outside. Yeah. Because actually, if I'm not there for a week, it's not the end of the world. You know, if you're to go off and get married or something. Exactly. And the honeymoon or something like that, then... You're not going to be at home, and so you you need to know that they're not going to die, and that's the reality. Plants, like animals, actually, you can't just go off and leave them. They do need attention. Mm. Yes. Well, I mean, if if I was touring around the world promoting a book, I would probably be all right because I would have a team of people who'd come in and water for me. So well, it it like, on your or if you've been on a tour, well, it's had um. Biblical rainfall. Well, yeah, you probably. Helps. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's about touring at the right time of the year, <laughs> and that's what I did. Do you know where people can get the book from? Amazon. Oh, no. is that a bad thing yeah, to say? Yeah, shocking. Yeah, anywhere else? Uh, independent bookshops. Any independent bookshop. <laughs> any good quality bookshop is going to sell them. <laughs> And the Great Dixter online shop. And Great Dixter online shop has them. All come when you're visiting Great Dixter, get them from there. Excellent. And you'll come out and sign them for people. With, they're, with... they're already signed, but oh, I'm happy they? to oh. personalise them if need be. <laughs> Fantastic. If I'm not travelling, of course. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the book is available on Amazon and also many other outlets. As with all the books that come out of the Great Dixter stable. It's not just a book about practical gardening, but about the people involved in creating it and the place itself. It's a tangible slice, a glimpse into the Great Dixter way of life. I realise I reference Great Dixter a lot in the podcast, and I hope you can indulge me because I genuinely love the place. When I step into the house, I get a feeling that's a strange mixture of being a trespassing child, but also of awe and magic and being home. It's enchanted there. If you can, go there. If you can't, get all the books and I promise you you will feel it thank you to Aaron for inviting me in and taking part in the interview thanks to you for listening and I'll catch you next Tuesday you can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.